Hi everyone, I did a video the morning of the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge, and in that video I pointed out how inadequate the protection measures were for the two bridge piers for the main span of the bridge. There were a lot of people who left comments to the effect that the Dolly cargo ship at over 100,000 tons was simply too big for any protective measures like dolphins and fenders around the bridge piers to be effective. In fact, in various interviews, I heard various engineers say the same thing, which I absolutely do not agree with. And I'll tell you why in this video, why this tragic bridge collapse was 100% preventable. I'm an engineer and most of my work for the past 20 plus years has involved designing and testing bridge foundations. It's simply part of the engineering discipline to examine such tragedies to learn not only what happened, but what could be done better in the future for similar projects. Engineers just don't sit around saying, oh well, it was a really big ship so nothing could be done to protect the bridge from impact. In this video, I'll show you what type of effective measures could and should be implemented to adequately protect important bridges in the United States from being destroyed or seriously damaged by barge or ship impacts. As a reminder, the Francis Scott Key Bridge suffered a catastrophic collapse due to a collision with the concrete columns supporting the bridge superstructure at one of the piers for the bridge's main span. This collapse resulted in the deaths of six of the eight construction workers who were on the bridge deck at the time of the collapse. The collision between the Dolly cargo ship and the bridge followed a loss of power that resulted in the inability to maneuver the ship. This occurred at 1.28 a.m. on March 26, 2024. Video footage released by the NTSB who's leading the investigation into the bridge collapse shows significant damage to the bow of the Dolly cargo ship. Such damage suggests that it was the bow of the ship that struck the reinforced concrete columns at the bridge pier and caused the bridge to collapse. You can see there's pretty much nothing left of the columns above the pier cap. So we're going around, you can see the Dolly cargo ship still trapped in place by the debris from the collapsed superstructure of the bridge. So we're going around to the bow of the ship. You can start to see there's extensive damage to the bow of the ship. Here's a big chunk out of the out of the ship. So that indicates that that's the part of the ship that struck the concrete bridge piers and caused them to collapse. Now the media has really started to explore the fact that the pier protection for this bridge was obviously wholly inadequate. The Dolly cargo ship, as big as it is, is somewhat of a middleweight by today's standards at over 100,000 tons and was made to carry 10,000 units or TEUs which stands for 20-foot equivalent units, which refers to a standard 20-foot long shipping container. As, as you can see, at 984 feet long, the dolly was about as long as the Eiffel Tower is tall, or about as long as two-thirds of the height of the Empire State Building. You have these types of ships coming and going through the main channel of the river below the bridge to access the Port of Baltimore. Note that the amount of cargo handled at the Baltimore port is relatively small compared to the tens of millions of units handled by the world's busiest ports, most of which are in China. Now you can see here, the port in Baltimore in 2019 handled a record of 98,000 20-foot equivalent units. The current blockage of the channel by the bridge debris and trapped ship will prevent ships moving through this channel to and from the port of Baltimore for several weeks, in, for several weeks in all likelihood. Especially if a lot of the salvage work has to be done with divers. This will create widespread economic impact to the city of Baltimore, the state of Maryland and really throughout the U.S. and beyond. Now just for reference, the world's largest cargo ship, according to my research, is the MSC Irina, which is flagged out of Liberia with a capacity of just over 24,000 units. Unfortunately, there have been several bridges in the past that have collapsed due to impacts from ships or barges. A 2018 report indicated that there were a total of 35 such collapses between the years of 1960 and 2015, which killed a total of 342 people. 18 of these collapses occurred in the United States. One well-known case of a bridge being destroyed by a ship impact was the Sunshine Skyway Bridge located in Tampa Bay, Florida. This collapse occurred in 1980 and involved the strike by a 609-foot long freighter. I mean, you can see it's a very similar situation to what's occurred here in, in Baltimore this week. Not surprisingly, the replacement for the Sunshine Skyway Bridge involved installation of extensive dolphins to protect the new bridge piers. 
The design approach for such protective systems can be relatively straightforward as long as you can accurately model the ship or barge in terms of the mass, speed, and time over which the speed goes to zero after a collision. The impact force from a ship, barge, or train can be calculated accordingly so that the size and configuration of the protective dolphin or fender system can be determined. I've done the design in the past for several cellular coffer dams and anchored bulkheads. In fact, there's a design manual that lays out in detail how to do these designs, and I've had my copy for over 30 years now, and that's the pile buck manual. As I pointed out in my previous video, you could see how small and inadequate the pier protection was for the Francis Scott Key Bridge. So why is it as a society we don't seem to learn important lessons from the past? In terms of bridge design and construction, I've seen a cycle of about 20 years or about one generation where poor design practices that were addressed many years ago start to be repeated uh, in current times. I think this is related to the cyclical loss of institutional knowledge that occurs when older, more experienced engineers, contractors, and other professionals retire. A lot of viewers of this channel have already retired from fields in various aspects of technical practice. My question for you is when you retired, did you feel like the organization or company you were leaving was in good hands with the younger folks uh, that would be running the show after you left? And it's, it's really not a knock on the people who remain behind, but usually when the more experienced people retire and leave, there's quite an experience gap to the next level of people that are actively practicing on these projects. So if you have any thoughts about that, please let me know in the comments. But also it's the case with many government agencies who are responsible for properly maintaining bridges and other important infrastructure in this country simply don't due to budget issues being the most commonly cited reason. You know, I've done several videos about various bridge failures, building problems uh, in the U.S., and I've only done a couple about issues in China with shoddy construction practices. And I think the ratio is probably 40 U.S. videos to one China video, but I really get lit up in the comments section from Chinese Communist Party sympathizers, for lack of a better term, because they don't acknowledge any fault at all with how their projects are being executed. And uh, it just seems to betray an underlying insecurity, I think, that they can't really accept any type of outside criticism or, frankly, any internal criticism from what I gather, uh, even if it's constructive. But, you know, such shoddy construction practices are often referred to as tofu drag construction. So my question for you today is, do you consider it to be tofu drag type practice to leave such an important bridge essentially unprotected from not uncommon collisions between ships and the bridge? Fortunately, I think we have a more open and practical approach to such situations in the United States. And there are many bridge owners who have already been proactive in upgrading the collision protection system for their bridges. One example is the Delaware Memorial Bridge, which connects Delaware to New Jersey over the Delaware River. They're spending $93 million installing collision protection barriers. This work started last summer and is scheduled to be completed next year. Here's a map showing the location of this bridge relative to the location of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Now I will note this work started in 2023 and is scheduled to be completed in 2025. And the duration of the construction has been extended because there's periods where no construction can be done due to the presence of Atlantic sturgeon in the, in the river. So we see this on virtually every bridge project or any construction project really, where there's some threatened or endangered species that forces uh, schedule changes and other accommodations during construction. Meanwhile, in California, officials have been pursuing the funding upgrades to the collision protection system for the Oakland Bay Bridge. This is due to the ship traffic traveling under the bridge to access the port of Oakland. The Bay Area is uh, seeking a grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation to upgrade the, uh, the fender system on the Bay Area bridges. Uh, what it's officially known as the Ship Collision Protection System. That would be an approximately $167 million upgrade to the bridges. So you heard that in California, they're going to spend $160 million to do the upgrades to provide more adequate collision protection to the Bay Bridge. The Port of Oakland can handle cargo ships nearly twice the size of the Dolly. 
There's also the Betsy Ross Bridge that connects Philadelphia to New Jersey, which has dolphins protecting its piers. These are also constructed using cellular coffer dams. So you can see the cellular coffer dams in front of the bridge piers, upstream and downstream. Again, this is the Betsy Ross Bridge. This is another bridge that connects New Jersey to Philadelphia. You can see here. Now, the pier protection is in the main span, located in the midpoint of the channel nearly. Now, we see there's no other pier protection that's installed at the bridge, and that's because the water depths are so shallow that a ship would run aground before it would strike the bridge piers. Another example of a good collision protection system is the Commodore Berry Bridge, which is another bridge connecting Philadelphia to New Jersey. You can see that these piers are protected by a stone revetment that extend well beyond the pier locations. These pier protection systems would be considered passive, and I think they're the most effective means of protecting bridge structures. There could be more active measures such as limiting ship speed, requiring tug escorts, etc., but I think passive systems would be far more reliable. To show you what I mean, let's look at a track of the dolly as it leaves its berth at the Port of Baltimore until it impacts the key bridge. Now this has obviously been sped up relative to real time. You can see there wasn't much time from the point when the ship lost power until it struck the bridge pier. So let's look at the timestamps from the harbor camera that recorded this disaster. The ship is moving normally out to sea and from left to right in the frame of the video. Now we see the timestamp of 1.24.32 a.m when the power goes out on the ship. The timestamp at the time of impact was 1.28.44. This means there was only four minutes and 12 seconds from the time power went out until the bridge was impacted. That's very little time to implement any active collision protection measures. It's been reported that the harbor pilot radioed a mayday call the first minute after losing power, and the police were able to close the bridge to passing traffic within about three minutes after that call was sent. Unfortunately, without adequate pier protection, that bridge was simply a sitting duck. So let's get into the details of how such collision protection systems are constructed. The most common system consists of driven steel sheets constructed in a ring pattern. These again are called cellular coffer dams and are infilled with stone, gravel, or concrete. Typically, the sheets are driven with a vibratory hammer. These coffer dams can be quite large, so let's go over some of the key steps in their construction. You can see that they're using a vibratory hammer to drive the steel sheets into the channel. Once that's complete, they push out their, their stone backfill or they could place concrete in, as infill. So the overall construction steps are you got to start with dredging and leveling the area. You drive temporary support piles. Then you install a bracing frame around these support piles and use that frame to install the sheeting. You drive the sheet piles to grade, then you block between the bracing frame and the steel sheets. Then you tie the sheet piles together at the top. You excavate the interior of the coffer dam. Sometimes you'll install internal bracing as water and soil are removed. And then you'll finish driving piles as required. And then again, you install the backfill. You seal it with a, a trimmy concrete placement. So those are the steps. It's a, a well-established process. You know, the uh, design standards for bridges relative to impacts were changed in the 1990s and required that new bridges have adequate collision protection systems installed. There have been reports that Maryland officials considered upgrading the collision protection system for the Francis Scott Key Bridge, but decided not to pursue it due to the associated costs. You know, it's rather common to retrofit projects for bridges long after their original construction to incorporate new design requirements, or to address vulnerabilities that weren't considered at the time of original design and construction. So again, addressing some of the comments to my previous video, some people said, well, this was designed in 1977. You know, it's, that's the way it is. It's like, no, uh, people should and often do upgrade their bridges to address such issues. This can be done to provide collision protection upgrades or to improve the seismic performance of the bridge. You know, when a lot of the bridges that are currently in use in the United States were designed and constructed, the th plate tectonics was just a theory. So there wasn't much appreciation for the mechanisms for how major earthquakes were generated. 
the recurrence intervals, and everything else that goes into modern design of bridges and other structures. Now let's consider that the original construction cost of this bridge was $60 million in 1977, or $360 million in today's dollars, and it took five years to build. There have been headlines indicating that the cost of replacement bridge for the Francis Scott Key location could exceed $2 billion. That's billion with a B. And this does not include all of the related economic impacts to the port and area commuters. So there's no doubt that the higher projected costs for the replacement bridge are much higher than the construction costs of the original bridge because of the costs associated with accelerated design and construction measures. In my experience, the least amount of time that this bridge could be replaced is about three years. You know, in a perverse way, Maryland DOT has benefited monetarily by not spending any more money protecting this bridge in the past and, and has, in essence, waited for the federal government to pay 100% of the costs associated with the post-collapse situation. So do you think this tragedy will spur a flurry of bridge upgrades to provide better collision protection from ships, barges, and trains? Let me know what you think in the comments. I'd like to give a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your all support. Uh, many of you are active behind the scenes and notify me when you see uh, interesting stories that I would relate to or perhaps consider for a video. The channel members, there's a single tier, uh, will typically get a preview of the video before it's made public, except in cases where it's breaking news story, but on regularly scheduled videos, they'll get the preview in advance. I also would like to send a shout out to those of you who have provided super thanks, and many of you have done it on multiple occasions. Again, I really appreciate that. And finally, thanks to those of you who have liked, subscribed, and left comments to these videos. There's been a lot of growth to the channel. It's been very exciting. So thanks for watching, everyone. Be sure to let me know what you think in the comments section.